Uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Christian Graham, MSP, and I'd like to welcome you all to the special edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. This afternoon's panel is titled This is Not a Drill, and we are delighted that so many people are able to join us today. And I look forward to hearing comments and questions from you as we get into our discussion. The media's terminology has shifted from climate change to climate emergency. But are we really behaving as if it's an emergency? How radical do we all need to be in the next decade in addressing the climate crisis that's already arrived? What is the best way for Scotland which can, 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 to kind of integrate climate change emergency into our national policies and improve awareness raising and education on our human and institutional capacity for what lies ahead. This panel aims to address all of these questions in the next 60 minutes, so please do stay with us. We are delighted they are all able to join us to take part, and I would encourage you all to use the event chat function to introduce yourself, stating your name and your geographical location, and pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. So, starting with the panel, I am very pleased to be joined by our three panellists, Zarina Ahmad, climate change leader and founder of Ethnic Minority Environmental Network. Good evening. Lloyd Austin, who is an experienced environmental policy analyst and is currently working as a part-time policy advisor to Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. Good evening. And Professor Stephen Reicher, who is the Bishop Wardlaw Professor of Social Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of St Andrews. And good evening to you too. Now there'll be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views in the panel throughout the event. As I've said, if you'd like to make a contribution, please enter them into the question and answer box. And make sure you state your first name and where you are this afternoon, and I'll try to get through as many as possible. However, I'd like to begin by asking each of our panelists, are we behaving as if we are in the middle of a climate change or an emergency? either as individuals or at a global environmental level. And I think I'll come first to Professor Zarina Ahmad. Zarina. Hello, hi. And just to correct you, I'm not a professor. Oh. I'm just <laughs> I'm just <laughs> Zarina. That, that's my right. first mistake this evening and it won't be the last. <laughs> that's all right. Um, just in case there's anybody thinking, oh my God, when did she become a professor? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it was a very, it's a very interesting question because I suppose I spent like my last ten years, ten to twelve years working with communities where climate change was a reality, was um, a, an emergency. People have been connected to different parts of the world where they saw the impacts of climate change, they understood the urgency of acting on climate change, and just recently. So for me, I suppose climate change was always an emergency. It was always a matter of urgency. We needed to act. We need to act now. However, just recently, with COP coming up, I've been involved in a COP uh, in a number of events, and and what I've heard a few times is that people have been coming and saying, "Oh, we want to interview because you make climate change interesting, right? You don't make climate change dry. You know, climate change can be a really dry subject." And I'm thinking, well, if if it's if we're in a climate crisis and if we're in an emergency, do we really think about making something interesting? I mean, did we think about that with the COVID? Did we think, well, how do we make it interesting? How do we not make it dry? So I would say the answer to that is probably not. Then we we are actually still treating it as an emergency, and we're not thinking of it as a crisis. Right. Th thank you very much. And now I'm going to come to. Professor Stephen Reicher, I hope you are a professor. Have I got that wrong too? No, I'm a professor, but basically, professor means I'm old, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> then, no I should have the title, then I should have the title <laughs> professor too. <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, I'll call you Professor Christine from now on. Um, I mean, when you ask the question, you know, are we acting as if we're in an emergency? The question very much comes down to what do we mean by we? Because normally, when you talk about states of emergency, they are definitions imposed by states on populations to justify changes of policy, very often actually very negative changes of policy. And this is very different. Climate emergency is very different because it's mainly about populations 
trying to get the governments and states to take the emergency seriously. Uh, and um, in many ways, the states and governments are revolting and resisting that definition. So when, over the next few weeks, we talk about COP26, there will be a lot of talk about the governments in their conference halls and about the protesters on the streets. But I think it should be seen as the other way around. The people on the streets are the people who are following the science. They're responding to all the evidence that unless we do something and do something soon, then the future of this planet is very much in the balance. And actually, it's those in the conference halls who are protesting, who are trying to say, well, we can't do it. We want to continue business as usual. It undermines our interests. So I think it's really important to reframe this, that, as I say, the science comes from the people and the protest comes from the governments in many ways. And I think that has huge implications for the way we think about the role of the public, because often we say, well, the role of the public is to change our consumption. You know, it's to eat different things. It's to travel in different ways and so on. And it's perfectly true that as with COVID, we've all got personal responsibilities and we need to take those responsibilities seriously. But first of all, we can't take those responsibilities seriously unless we get accurate information on what the problems are. And when you look at the polling, most people will say, yes, there is a climate emergency. But then when they go on to say, what do we do about it? On the whole, people don't have the information that allows us to understand the most important things we can do. So, yes, we recycle. And most people will say recycling is the major thing we should do. But actually, there are many other things we should be doing. So we need that um, information from governments and states. And secondly, of course, we need the practical support. If, for instance, one of the, the major things we could do uh, to deal with a climate emergency is to give up our cars. But we can't give up our cars unless we've got decent public transport and affordable public transport. So again, states need to act. So in many ways, the most critical psychological question, and I speak psychologist, is not what people do individually, but what people do collectively and what we do together to make the states which claim to represent us take seriously the threat to all of us. So yes, I think people are individually taking uh, seriously the fact there's a climate emergency. We need to do it collectively so that governments and states themselves treat this as a real and very serious emergency. Thank you very much. I now uh, call Lloyd Austin, please. Thank you, Christine. Like you, I'm old and also not a professor. Uh, <laughs> um, first of all, uh, I think it's worth welcoming the change in terminology that you mentioned. Um, it's not only in the media, of course. Uh, many governments have uh, adopted the term climate emergency. Um, our first minister in Scotland did so in, in early 2019. Um, and I think that is welcome. But in answer to your question, are we behaving as though that's an emergency? I think in a word, I'd agree uh, with Serena that the, the answer is no. I mean, if we look at other emergencies that governments have had to respond to, whether that be uh, war, uh, natural disasters, uh, or even the, the, the current pandemic, uh, the government's responses have been weak. And I think that is, uh, uh, illustrated by, by Stephen's description there of the different, uh, the different attitudes of, of government and individuals, whether those individuals are individually responding or collectively responding. Uh, I think uh, too often climate change is still seen as one of many sorts of issues that uh, governments have to deal with rather than being the overriding emergency of our time. Um, so there is there's a lot of rhetoric there's a lot of tinkering around the edges, but there's not enough major change. There's not enough uh, real leadership. Um, and I, I think uh, from Stop Climate Chaos point of view, we're very much a NGO movement, a campaigning uh, movement. And, and, and we, we do see that kind of public engagement in the debate that is not reflected by government action. It's reflected in government rhetoric, but not in government delivery of change. 
Thank you very much. Can I encourage uh, those in the audience to put their questions forward, please? Because I'll, I'll start off by answering a few to get the ball rolling. Uh, and I'll put this to Zarina. Um, uh, and then I've got one to follow up for Austin. I think it's probably the way that it should be directed. Uh, Zarina, are you are you frustrated with the pace of change and the commitments to climate emergency? I mean, is it that COP26 will just be blah, 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 as somebody said, and there'll be very little change? Totally, totally frustrated. Um, and the reason why I'm frustrated is because the way climate change is spoken about and the narratives that we have, there's this total inequity in it. And um, what I mean by that is that there's discussions that happen in the global north, the Western countries, that aren't the same conversations that you're having in the global south. Right? The global south are the ones that are being impacted by climate change. It is an emergency and it has been an emergency there for many, many years. But yet the conversations we don't think about climate change as a global well, we do think of it as a, as a as a global issue, but when we're talking like like with like legislation or politics, it becomes very insular, and we think about well, what is Scotland doing or what is the UK doing? But we don't actually put Scotland in the context in the global context, and I think that's where the discussions are missing. We don't link what we do here to other parts of the world, and I think that's where. Some of the big frustration for me comes from because I, the, from the work that I do, I meet many people that have got connections to their homelands, their families, where climate change has been real for a number of years. And when we sit here and we listen to COP or we listen to the first minister with their targets, and it's just not enough and not soon enough. Um, and that's what really frustrates me. Is because we tend to ignore things that don't impact us. If we're not being impacted, we don't need to act. It's only when we get impacted. So it's become very reactive. Our our behaviour, our policies, um, our strategies, all are reactive rather than proactive. I don't know if anybody any else wants to come in from the panel on that particular thing. Uh, I mean, I have concerns about COP26 as well. But I'm not on the panel, but I'd love to hear what your concerns are. Um, I know, you know, just put your hand up if you want to come in, Lloyd or Stephen, on that. You know, Lloyd. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, I feel uh, Serena's frustration. I think uh, everybody is, is frustrated to some extent. I think uh, it's not frustration because it's too late. I mean, more could have been done already. Uh, but I think it's worth um, stressing that the longer we leave it, the harder it's going to be uh, and the more disruptive it will be and uh, the costlier it will be. It's an issue that is, you know, is an absolute classic uh, example of that thing called preventative investment, that if you invest now, you can prevent costs in the future. Uh, and so, therefore, I think there is a real desire amongst people to see action. And whether or not there will be action coming after COP, I don't know. I mean, there's a, well, uh, subject to pandemics, there's a COP every year. Um, and um, they all are <coughs> uh, move the, the, the process on a bit. But what real change has got to happen at the government level after COP? Governments have got to live up to the rhetoric they make going into those meetings in their actions after the meetings. Yes, Stephen. I suppose the frustration for me is that governments and, um, well, not just governments, but there is a tendency to talk about climate change as an emergency, but to want to graft it on to business as usual that it's just something you do alongside everything you did before. And the whole point about an emergency is we have to rethink the things that we've been doing that got us into this mess. And I thought that was exemplified the other day by Boris Johnson's speech about green is good, uh, likening it to greed is good. Um, now, I think there are some really profound changes that we need, both cultural and economic changes. One comes down to the very way in which we look at ourselves and understand who we are, our identities as human beings. 
because more and more in contemporary society, we, we position people as consumers. Neoliberalism puts us as individual consumers um, competing with each other. And first of all, that atomizes us, divides us, stops us acting collectively, but it makes the measure of our worth how much we consume. You are a valued human being if you have a bigger car, if you go on longer holidays, um, if, you, um, uh, if you consume more. And we've simply got to change that understanding. We've also got to change our, our basic understanding of our relationship to nature. For the last 50 years and more, we've had a conception which is we dominate nature. We ignore nature. The rhythms of nature have got nothing to do with us. So in the winter, we don't have to worry about the cold because we generate so much heat to overcome it. We don't have to care about our diet because we have strawberries and everything else all year round. We act as if we are there to dominate nature. And it seems to me we need really profound changes in the nature of the culture the nature of who we are, the nature of our economy, and the sorts of things that got us into this mess are not going to be the solutions of getting us out of this mess. And I see no indication of that um, uh, on the whole by governments or by COP26. And so you simply cannot continue with business as usual if you want to acknowledge there's a real emergency which needs need to change fundamental things about our society. I'd like to bring Vivian in Edinburgh, Serena. I think this will pick up on something that you said. Who's asking, how do we get people interested in combating climate change when you were saying, you know, well, it's not on our doorstep. We've not got the floods or the droughts or the fires, so um, you know, we tend to be reactive. So, how do we interest people? That's for Vivian in Edinburgh. Yeah, and that it's always well. First start is. Never assume that people are interested in climate change. They might not be interested in the jargon, um, but if you actually create space to have a discussion and then understand where someone's at and what I mean by, and listen to the the issues that they face, and those issues are going to be compounded by a climate crisis. So, for instance, if somebody's in food poverty. Food security is a huge issue for climate crisis. So it's having those connect, having those conversations and making those connections, connections to the climate crisis is really important. Um, and I think that's how we can engage everyday people. Is when people are whatever the whatever the issues that they're suffering. For instance, somebody might be suffering from fuel poverty. Again, access to energy, uh, access to um, well, I was going to say free energy, which would be great, but it's not free energy, but access to affordable energy. Again, with the climate crisis, um, are looking at our food, food security, looking at our transport system, looking at all the different areas, looking at health and looking at health inequalities. How is our health going to get impacted? Looking at the green spaces that we have and who has access to those green spaces and what does that mean, connection to nature mean? Um, so. If we look at different parts of our lives and we think about how those are going to be impacted by climate crisis, that's where we can have those really important discussions. But whereas if we start just talking about like the carbon footprint and carbon emissions, that doesn't really mean anything to the everyday person. It's still, and I've been doing this work for, for many years, and you know, when I talk about carbon emissions, yes, I get it, but I can't visually see it. I don't it's still very abstract. Yes, Stephen. You're you're muted. Oh, am I? I am not I now. Muted? No, good. No, no. Normally that's my problem, but I think it's being handled automatically from the centre at the moment, so I I, I won't take blame for that one. Uh, so um, I think we need to make a really core distinction between caring about the environment and seeing yourself as an environmentalist and taking action. There was some really interesting research uh, in the states um, I saw about a year or two ago. And what that showed is that, not surprisingly, more deprived groups, ethnic minorities, black Americans, are more concerned about the environment because they suffer more. When there's a flood in New Orleans, who is it who can go in their four by four to the hills and be safe? And who is it who sits in the floods on the roof of their house? So it is the deprived who suffer more and who are more concerned. However, they were less likely to define themselves as environmentalists 
because they saw environmentalism as a movement as being primarily white and middle class. And that goes to some, back to something that Zarina said, that we must make inequalities at the very core of this, in the same way that we've understood through COVID, that inequalities are central. They're central both because um, uh, more deprived groups and ethnic minorities suffer more, and because they're more alienated from the state and trust the state less, and therefore don't trust them when they, for instance, try to roll out vaccines. So unless the environmentalist movement is an inclusive movement, which understands those differences and understands those different impacts and changes its way of action so that people come into it, I think we've got a very real problem indeed. So as I say, what's crucial here is not just as individuals being concerned, but coming together collectively. And that's the way in which we will actually achieve change, force governments to take this seriously, force uh, states to change their policies in profound ways. I, I'm glad, Stephen, you mentioned inequalities, because my concern is a lot of the discussion about the things that individuals can do um, to protect you know, the environment, that's okay if you've got money. But if you're worried about just heating your house or food or whatever, I'm afraid you haven't got time to bother about that. So, you know, I'll bring in Lloyd. I just I'd mentioned that because you've touched on inequality, which to me, the inequality works both ways. Could you, would you agree that inequality works in that they are the people who are most affected by it in these other countries, but also they're the people who are least able to contribute individually or collectively as a group to the environment because they are poor themselves. But that, I mean, in a way that goes back to my comment about Johnson and his green is good. Um, because if you see this in consumerist terms, and if yes. you see the solutions in such terms, so for instance, making it more expensive to go on holidays, more expensive to buy food, etc. Well, that means that those who are well off can still buy it, okay. and those who are in food poverty get even more in food poverty. And that's why you cannot solve this problem on the basis of what brought it about in the, in, in the first place. Those consumerist solutions, those solutions that make it more expensive to do things that are bad for the planet are not going to be a solution, and they're going to reinforce resistance to the environmentalist movement. We've seen that, for instance, in France. The Gilets Jaunes, uh, a huge social movement, were profoundly alienated by moves which made it more expensive, for instance, to do the fundamental things they needed to do. So you've alienated social forces that we need to bring on board to make this a comprehensive and united social movement. Lloyd, you wanted to, I think, if I can get Lloyd's microphone on, yes. <coughs> Uh, thanks, Christine. No, I was going to uh, agree with yourself in terms of the need to, to view this through the inequalities lens. And I think we need to recognise that the policies that we need are the ones that are going to help address inequalities as well as address uh, carbon emissions. I agree with Stephen in terms of uh, that um, just adding costs to what you might call uh, undesirable bad activities is not the the solution. There is a place for that, but it has to be within a, a framework that is addressing inequalities as a whole, so that good uh, uh, carbon reducing alternatives become cheaper and more easily available to everybody. Uh, uh, and issues like addressing uh, heating uh, challenges through the lens of fuel poverty is the way in which we should go, rather than simply taxing or, or making gas more expensive or something. You know, I mean, I think it's a mixture of appropriate policies that are appropriately uh, designed uh, to. Uh, Achieve, achieve the uh, the carbon ends at the same time as the social ends. I think it's important that uh, the, the social and the cultural and the environmental things are treated together, so that the, um, that we don't see one as competing with the other. 
I, I'm going to ask an, another question. I, I think I'll start with you, Stephen, because it actually touches again on what you said about you know the people who are um, changing um, attitudes, and that's actually what makes the difference. Does it? But is it behind the scenes diplomacy at COP26? Because we know that's where it will really take place. Already, probably is taking place, and it, you know the politicians will simply uh, come out with um, buzzwords and um, things like that. Uh, to make government policy changes, or is it the demonstrations on the street? If people really, you know, took it into their own hands, I'm not encouraging um, unlawful demonstrations, but peaceable demonstrations, can that would that have more impact on pushing governments rather than them meeting uh, at COP26, or is it both? Mm. Well, I'm going to be at COP26 because we're going to be doing some research around um, the crowds and crowd dynamics. That's my main research area, in fact. So we're looking at um, uh, the dynamics of protest. And the reason why I'm interested in that research is that for me, for a long time, you know, crowds have been seen as a problem. Crowds have been seen as irrational. Crowds have been seen almost as the antithesis of democracy. But for me, a participatory democracy is one where people can raise their voice and can raise their voice uh, collectively. And for me, protest, it, you know, the sound of protest is the noise of a healthy democracy uh, of people uh, articulating their views and feeling safe to do so. And I think one of the really important points about how we uh, handle and manage and police such events is to understand that they are not a threat to democracy, they are democracy and they should be facilitated and supported. And the more that happens, the more inclusive they become. If protest is seen as something which is dangerous, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Only the street fighting men turn out and you don't come with your children, elderly people don't come, uh, disabled people don't come, vulnerable people don't come. So I do think that inclusive protest is important and I do think that protest is the sound of democracy. And I hope we have very, very large and peaceful crowds making the point very clearly to governments that they should do what the science says. As I say, the real protesters at COP26 will be the governments who are refusing to do what is necessary to keep us safe. And we mustn't allow their protests to, to succeed. Lloyd, I see you nodding. Do you want to say something? And then I'll come to Zarina. Uh, thanks. Yes. No, I agree. We need both. Um, we, we do need uh, the behind the scenes policy work, he says as a policy geek. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Stop Climate Chaos Scotland is, is to some extent a, a classic example of the, the diversity of approach that we do put in. You know, we respond to government consultations, we lobby government, we uh, come up with policy solutions. But equally, uh, we're very much involved in, in public engagement, in trying to campaign and raise awareness and uh, encourage our members to go on the march. So uh, there's, there's, there's a big COP26 coalition organised uh, march on the middle Saturday. Uh, I'll be there and I'll look forward to being researched by Stephen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, so, so we need both um, because governments uh, do do listen to some extent. Uh, obviously, we hope they'd listen more. Uh, but uh, you know, if you look back in in history, all significant changes have come about by people protesting and people campaigning and people raising public voices. You know, whether or not that's about uh, social or economic concerns, or now this one we're talking about an environmental concern. All 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 of uh, significant changes in in government policy and, and government actions have been kind of government convinced themselves that it was their bright idea uh, at the time uh, but it was often came about because uh, through political parties and through other social networks and so forth uh, um, they were they were influenced to do what they felt the public wanted and demonstrating that the public want greater and faster action on, on climate change is necessary. But equally, uh, we, it, it, it is helpful to the, the movement as a whole for you know, specialist NGOs that know what they're talking about in specialist policy areas to do 
behind the scenes diplomatic work. So a bit of everything. And hopefully government will listen to some or all of it. Zarina, you've been very patient. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say um, that it's not about one moment in time, right? So, yeah, having a march at, um, at COP26 is really important because it shows like how many people, the, the numbers, the volume, and it means a lot and it says a lot. But you also need to have that constant conversations, those two-way conversations. And I want to say the drip, drip, drip effect, but it's probably more than that. Um, and, and that's really important. But my interest is probably making sure those voices that never get heard are being heard whether it's at COP26 or whether it's with in front of a politician, because sometimes we forget that we actually live in a democratic country, right? Sometimes the politicians are held on a pedestal and they're not approachable, right? I mean, I've and never we're looking... been on a pedestal, Zelina. I've never been on one. <laughs> I, know, I know we're lucky in Scotland, though, that our, <laughs> our politicians are much more approachable. But, you know, recently I've been working I, in, in the rest of England and it's like, oh, you can't have a you can't have a conversation with this politician or that politician. And you're like, really? You know, but we we are the taxpayers. You know, we pay for their positions. We hold them. But yeah, for, for me, those are marginalized, like the BME communities, you know, people that are in poverty, you know, people with disability, all of these marginalized communities, they very rarely get their voices heard. They very rarely get brought to the table. And there's always people in think tanks and other NGOs speaking on behalf of them. And that's what I would like to start seeing a change of. And I think like having COP and, and embedding inequalities and climate justice at the heart of climate crisis is so important because we will then have a truly more democratic approach to our political system. I mean, I would say get rid of the political system, but that's another conversation. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> oh that's hurting me. That's hurting me. Uh, I think I think someone was trying to do a best. It, Lloyd. Uh, thanks. I was just agreeing entirely with what Zarina is saying and, and, and just thought of a, a, another thing to plug, really. Um, Stop Climate Chaos has worked with the Scottish Government on what's been known as the uh, Glasgow Climate Dialogues, which has been a, 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 a means by which um, our members in Scotland have worked with their partners in the Global South to ensure that the Global South voices are heard. And there, there's a communique that's been produced from that process. And we very much hope that the Scottish Government will will pick up that communique, uh, which they agreed with with, with us and the, the partners from the Global South, and do what they can to promote that to all the other participants in uh, at COP. Because you know, in this global situation, it's voices from the Global South that are often not as heard as they should be. I have a question from Liz, who hasn't told me where she's from, uh, but she asked, and I'll, I'll ask you which one wants which of you wants to take this. Do you think the government needs to remove the growth imperative from the economic system? And if so, how can this be done? Oh, it's gone all quiet. Zarina. And oh, then yeah, more. I think I think the growth, the economic growth um, framework is what has got us into the trouble where we are because it's based around greed. It's based around more, more, more. It's based around competition. Um, it's based around um, what's in it for me, rather than the whole collective um, way that Stephen was talking about, that we should be thinking about collective. Also recognizing our position within the planet, within the planet boundaries, the planetary boundaries as well, because what we're doing is exploiting and extracting. Uh, and if we keep doing that, the economic growth model just will not work. And we can see it's already a you know, it's already causing a crisis. So yes, we do need to move away from it, but I'm going to pass it over to somebody else who can talk about how we can do this. Lloyd. Uh, yeah, I, I agree we need to move away from it. Um, it it's a, an issue that's been around for decades. It was in the 1960s that Robert Kennedy said that GNP 
uh, as the Americans call it, or GDP as we call it, is a, is a, a measure that measures everything but what's important. Um, and, and so it's always been an issue that just simply adding up the value of all the trans, uh, transfers of cost uh, of goods and services in the economy doesn't measure things like friendship things like education, things like uh, poetry and culture, things or all the things that uh, contribute to our well-being. And so it's a very simplistic, it's a very monetized, very money-centric way of measuring our, our success. And actually prosperity and well-being means a lot more than that. Um, I think obviously, uh, given the discussion we had earlier about inequality, there's still an important aspect of uh, uh, being able to meet people's needs or people being able to meet their own needs. But that isn't necessarily measured by the traditional means of measuring growth. And we need to move away from that. So we need, uh, we need a, a different measure. And th uh, bodies like the Wellbeing Alliance are doing a lot of work on this and creating new measures. Um, but government needs to be brave and government needs to be able to stand uh, governments at all levels, uh, Scotland, UK, EU, you know, all, all, all governments need to stand up and say they will not be measured by the comparison in growth between one country and another and be seen as trying to compete with those other, other countries. Um, we need, we need to move to, uh, I think it's Bhutan that has a gross national happiness measurement. And uh, I think we, we could all adopt similar methods like that. And government needs to say what we are here for is to, uh, for the well-being of our population, not for simply uh, maximizing growth, because that can actually result in, in greater inequalities, let alone dealing with social and environmental questions. Before I bring in Stephen, how do you measure happiness? I think so. <laughs> I, you, you said I wonder it. whether Stephen might be a better person to answer that, but there are different, there are various ways in which uh, pr prosperity in the widest sense can be measured. I'll bring in Stephen. Perhaps he'll help me there. How you measure a nation's happiness? Okay, so I'll come on to that because actually there's a lot of work um, on that. But I just going back to growth. I mean, the model env modern environmentalist movement in many ways came out of the uh, the book The Limits to Growth and the Club of Rome. Um, the Limits to Growth was published in 1972. So next year is the 50th anniversary. And the reason why I know this is the foundation, it's a German foundation which is funding our research, uh, comes out of people who were linked to the Club of Rome and that want to celebrate the anniversary next year. And um, our research will feed into what they're doing. So this issue of growth and the growth of as the be all and end all has been critiqued for a long, long time. Now, there is a danger, of course, in saying, oh, it's not about um, uh, uh, material goods, it's all about happiness, because there is a danger that people who have say to people who have not, don't worry about that, let's just all be happy. It can be, under certain configurations, a very conservative thing indeed. And again, it can feed into this issue of inequalities of, of sort of privileged middle, middle class people to just saying, oh, well, it's all fine. You know, you don't need to worry about many goods. And they don't because they've got uh, many goods. And when you look at the research on well-being and happiness up to a certain level, then material uh, possessions and material worth is absolutely critical. But interestingly, they're critical because they're about social participation. So if you take something like, say, having a mobile phone or having a television or having a computer, actually, as a young person, you can't be part of the social network without it. You can't meet up with your mates without it. You don't know what's going on if you don't have Snapchat and so on. So even when material goods are important, they are important in relation to well-being. Now, when you've got a certain level of material goods, actually more don't make you any happier at all. Um, you know, once you pass, get, uh, get past that threshold, but many, many people in our country and many, many people in our world don't meet that threshold. So it's a pretty good argument for taxing those who've got a lot 
because it doesn't make them any happier and giving it to those who haven't got enough to be happy in the first place. In terms of happiness, there have been many people who've argued uh, in this country, Richard Layard, for instance, was very much at the center of this work and was trying to urge the government to, uh, uh, to make indices of happiness, um, which were measured various, using various you know, uh, uh, psychometric types of scales um, uh, to, to see how happy, happy people felt to use that as an index, which went alongside issues of GDP. But let me just finish with an anecdote. I, I remember a number of years ago, sitting in the Overgate in Dundee. I don't know how many people know it, the Overgate in Dundee. It's a it's a shopping centre, a typical modern shopping centre, with, with with a friend who came from uh, a country where you know which had been very very different. And she was saying she found it quite bizarre because everybody was buying things they didn't need. You know, they were buying you know, a top, but they already had 20 tops, or they were buying another pair of shoes, right? Because again, consumption and having a new top at the party or new shoes were seen as important in various ways, but they didn't need them. And when you saw it through her eyes, this behavior was quite bizarre, this relentless, you know, accumulation of so many clothes, so many goods, which quite frankly, it's only, because culturally there are norms saying you've got to do this, that you do it. And if we challenged and changed those norms of consumption, then those things wouldn't make us any happier. So the first thing I would say is let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Material goods are important and everybody needs a certain level of them. And denying that will get us back into the same old problem that this will be seen as a, uh, a movement of the privileged. However, the gross inequalities and the gross overconsumption that we have. You know, we live in a society where many people throw away about 30% of their food while more and more people are going to food banks. We need enough so people aren't going to food banks, but we don't need to be buying so much food that 30% of it is thrown away. Given that there is this direct link between consumerism, materialism and goods and things that we throw away and the production goes into them that I'm presuming from what you're saying that is in part due, part leading to global uh, warming, the way we live our lives, the things that we buy that we don't need and so on. That's only a small thing, but part of it. Do you think COVID uh, and the fact that people have been, as I am tonight, as you are, uh, speaking from our homes, working from homes, uh, people um, much more having to stay at home, less social contact, less going out. Has it made them in any way, do you think, revaluate their attitude to consumerism and to global warming in that, you know, here we are in a pandemic, it was very, very scary. Do you think that's had any impact on the way we've viewed the world and our responsibilities? Uh, uh, Stephen would like to, to answer. Okay, we, we wrote a book last year called Together Apart, which was free, um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you can get it as a free download or you can buy it and the proceeds go to save the children. But we called it Together Apart for a very simple reason. The, one of the mistakes, I think, of, of, of the pandemic is we talked about social distancing. Now, we needed physical distancing because if you were physically close to people, you could infect or even kill them. But we needed social togetherness because we learned more and more how those connections are absolutely central to our well-being. In fact, there's a whole research literature on how feeling part of a group of a community is good for your well-being. The importance of connectedness is really important. Now, the danger in saying we will have learned that and it will go on is that we forget things. These things will not endure of their own, um, but we have an opportunity to build on that. One of the biggest pandemics, for instance, we have is loneliness, loneliness of old people, and the importance of understanding those links is really important. I think that we've learned other things. One of them is we don't have to travel all the time. It is a bliss to me that I can have meetings on Zoom, whereas in the past, I'd have to get up in four, at four o'clock in the morning and get back at two o'clock in the morning to go to a meeting in London. We don't need as much as long as much uh, travel and long haul travel. In terms of the way we do work, in part, 
it's important to go to work and come together because that collectivity is important. But at the same time, we don't need to go to work all the time and suffer the costs and the hassle of commuting. So I think some of the lessons that we've learned from COVID, we can build on to rethink the way we live our lives, the way we're connected, uh, the ways we travel and so on. So I think those are really important lessons. Yes, uh, and I'll come to Lloyd then, uh, uh, Zarina, about that. And I'm trying to tie into our attitude, global warming, and how we are connected to this. You know how how this has been a huge shock to society. I think uh, COVID, um, and some it may have had a collective change in the way we look at things. I'm not sure yet. And I think we agree with Stephen. We are liable to forget quite quickly. Um, which is unfortunate. But Lloyd, I'd like to see if you think it's made any, you know, this input of COVID has any difference to, to our attitude to global warming, consumerism, as they're all tied in. And then I'll come to you, Zarina, if that's okay. Um, well, to, to be perfectly honest, I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to uh, reflect anecdotally on, on my own experience. Uh, I don't have the research and the sort of social attitudes background, but. Um, Last year, when the lockdowns were at their height, you know, I think there were several things that people noticed. You know, the the quiet, clean air where there was no travel, uh, the value of green spaces, somewhere to go and exercise and get fresh air, etc. Um, and 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 unfortunately, I think uh, those sorts of things seem to have sort of been one of those things, as you say, that we've we've forgotten the the, the way in which uh, traffic has bounced back uh, uh, has been, um, uh, I think, uh, to some extent, a, a shame because you know the the benefits of uh, of 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 le less congestion and and less traffic were were appreciated, but then they were discarded. If you see what I mean. And I think one of the difficulties is that is that leads back to the whole challenge of can individuals change things by individual actions, or how much do responsibility do governments have to lead and create the circumstances where people can take the right individual actions? Because uh, you know we're talking about travel. One of the biggest challenges is the respective costs and ease between private cars and public transport. And the lack of uh, investment in active travel and in public transport and so forth from, from governments, and the, 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 the lack of uh, penalising aviation and, and private car travel in, in different ways, um, notwithstanding the comments we, we made about inequalities, which have to be uh, taken into account, has meant that it's been very easy for everybody to jump back into their cars again. And so the benefits of uh, the uh, the absence of traffic during lockdown were just sort of forgotten. Um, and I, I just think that there's there are lessons to be learned, but what we've got to do is we've got to draw them out and, and shout about them and encourage government to, to step up to the plate in both leadership and in policy change. Zarina. Yeah, it's just interesting hearing Lloyd and Stephen because um, the examples that they've given, actually the, some of the communities I work with are just not the same examples of their life experiences. For instance, many have been many communities from BME communities have been working in the care sector. So we're at the front line working in shops in retail, again on the front line working in hospitals, again at the front line. So their lives didn't change, but they were impacted because they were at the front line. So in terms of like a crisis, not just climate crisis, it just highlighted the inequalities and where we make our frames of reference to what a world could be, what the vision could be, what a change could be. But even like access and green space, a lot of people, I remember a lot of people talking about access and green space and being able to go out for walks. Whereas I, I remember speaking to a community group and they were saying that 
you know, there was a family who had like three children. They were in a high rise flat and they were stuck there the whole time. And they were so scared yeah. of going out because the narrative that was coming out was that BMP, BME communities are more likely to get COVID. So their mom was terrified of sending her children out. For three months, they were stuck in a flat. So, you know, so I, so it's really hard for me to have this kind of conversation when we're thinking about, well, who are we talking about when we talk about how people's lives change? Um, and that's still, and this is what I'd like to see, like that more collective vision of what it could look like, what a vision could look like for all people in society when we have these conversations would be really, really appreciated in a way. Um, but yeah, that's one thing. And then the second thing I want to talk about is, is the use of plastics, right? Just because I'm an environmentalist, did a lot of work around the environment. And then there was this whole movement of like, trying to get rid of like single use plastic, getting rid of like, you know, um, you know, like straws, um, coffee cups, all of this, right? So we were at this point where we were reaching like a peak momentum, I think, just before the COVID. COVID hits and then it's like, Okay, we've got we've got this virus that's spreading like the plague, so everything has to be disposable. So we went back, in fact. So, you know, there are some lessons that we can learn, but there was also some things that actually, unfortunately, took us a few steps back. So, yeah, so like disposable masks, disposable plastic, carrier bags, everything that people were just chucking, chucking, chucking. Yeah. So I think there's a lot. We've still got a long way to go. Yeah, I can remember walking down the middle of a main road on a Sunday and not a car in sight. It was something in the middle of a town. It was something to experience. Um, can I ask you, finally, before I ask you to do a little summing up, is does it matter that major polluter like China and Russia will not be coming to COP26? Does it matter? Somebody want to answer that? Lloyd. I'll try. Um, well, first of all, I don't think it's as uh, black and white as they're not coming. Uh, I, I think their representatives will be there. It will be lower right. level diplomats rather than the presidents. So uh, it won't be a head of government type delegation that uh, you know the UK will have, and we understand the US will have, and the EU countries will have, and so on. Um, so I think it's I think if it was as black and white as they weren't there at all, that would be uh, a concern. But you know I think uh, the key thing is that uh, we've got to try our best to get an agreement. Um, and they'll, you know, I mean, I think if, if you look back at past COPs, I mean, we've got to hope that Glasgow is more like Paris than like Copenhagen. Um, but the point is that I think uh, that if the UN framework system can bring all countries along, eventually all countries will, will come along. And there has to be some leadership from good countries, if you see what I mean. Those countries that uh, profess leadership have to be able to demonstrate that they are living up to their pledges. And to some extent, I think that Western European countries and the US and so forth are, are not doing that as well as they could do at the moment. Um, and, and I think uh, in all terms of all countries, I think that the other issue is that as well as uh, demonstrating leadership amongst the industrialized nations, there needs to be proper concern about the sort of global inequality issues, the voices of the global south help, you know, contributing to uh, um, addressing uh, the impact of climate change in, in the developing world. But equally, some countries like uh, China and Russia have equal challenges uh, to, to ours in terms of inequalities and, and so forth. And we've got to be aware of that. So I, I think uh, the, the more countries, the better, the higher level, the better. But I don't think just an absence of one president or two presidents 
is a reason for us not to try and make it work. Now, I've just seen a whole pile of questions, and I, I better. I'm going to ask from Sandy from Granton on Spee. He asks at COP26, ignoring the threat from nuclear weapons. Uh, do the speakers see nuclear as being in the mix when it comes to developing alternative energy or a threat to be avoided? Well, there's something to throw in. Can, some, can, some, can one person deal with that so I can get in other ones? Do you, do you want to comment on nuclear or do you want to skip it? Zarina. Okay. Uh, Zarina, please. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to comment a little bit on nuclear because I'm going to link it to arms and military. And that's another thing that in COP discussions that government do not talk about. And it's like the impact of military arms, how much carbon it produces, yeah, uh, how much devastation causes, why do we need so much, so many wars, why do we need so much military, and um, the cost, everything. So, you know, that has to be included in the, in the climate negotiations. So yes, in that mix, I would also put nuclear power in that mix. Yes. Well, I've got another. Yes, sorry, Stephen, please. Uh, microphone, please. Thank you. I wanted to make a very small point, just about the fact that while people will call um, the climate situation an emergency, I mean the polling suggests about two thirds of people do it. We still don't actually appreciate how much of an emergency it is, and it links to the question in the sense that in the first half of 2020. Five million people were displaced because of wars and conflicts. Ten million people were displaced because of climate change. So I think it's really important to understand just what an existential crisis this is, and to understand that all sorts of other social issues, are, like immigration, for instance, are tied to climate change. People come to this country not because they think, well, it's uh, we, we don't like the weather where we are, let's come to Scotland and enjoy the beautiful sunshine, and they come because they have to, and because their lives are so absolutely yeah. desperate. So I do think it's important just to understand what a profoundly existential crisis this is and how important it is. Serena, I'd like to come in, but I want to get Gary in from Inverness. Oh, there's Big Ben chiming in my house. Gary from Inverness is asking if COVID might be a warning from nature, and how do we get the message over about imminent danger? Does anybody want to pick up on that? COVID being a warning from nature. Lloyd, microphone, please. Well, if the uh, if the hypothesis that uh, COVID originated in bats is true. Uh, and uh, th that uh, it um, was the interaction between uh, people and, and those bats, uh, then yes, it is a warning, because I think it goes back to what Stephen said um, to some extent earlier on, in terms of how it's a warning about our relationship with nature. I think uh, nature is part of the answer to climate change, uh, because the oceans, the uh, rainforests in Scotland, our own woodlands and peatlands, etc., are a massive carbon store. They have potential to, to uh, sequester more more carbon, but they are the they're an indicative of our relationship with nature, with the biosphere and the atmosphere, and our uh, need to move to a situation where we we're living more in harmony with our planet. So it is a warning in that um, sense. I think I think we've lost um we've lost Austin, I think, somewhere. Uh, I don't know where he's gone. Not you, not you sorry, not you, <laughs> Lloyd. Uh, we've lost Jesus. Stephen. Um, I'm getting getting yeah, we've lost Stephen. I can see that. I'm looking at the chat function. I've got a last question, more niche, but it's one that hello, we're back. It's uh, Graham from Dumfries saying, why are the temporary infrastructure like cycle lanes introduced during the pandemic now being removed? I know some have been removed in some cities, some haven't. Why are these not permanent changes to help with behavioural changes? Um, and I know in some cities they've kept some of them and some have been removed. So do you want to talk just as a little one at the end about cycle lanes? Important, as more people have taken to their bicycles. Lloyd, microphone, I, please. I, I can't remember. Was it Graham who made that comment? It's I, I Graham, Graham from Dumfries. 
I would agree entirely. I think, uh, you know, that was one of the lessons from the pandemic that we could learn and embed. Um, we need greater investment in active travel. And the best way of investing in active travel is to create infrastructure that allows walking, cycling, wheeling, disabled access, et cetera, et cetera, because that is one of the biggest reasons why people don't use those forms of travel to get around, because they feel that unsafe trying to uh, do so on busy roads. And so investment in infrastructure for active travel is one of the, the best things we can do within Scotland. And Stephen, you wanted to, to say something about that. Okay, well, I, I, I say this is very keen cyclist, so the more cycling, I would say it's wonderful. Um, but a few grudging cycle lanes, I don't think make that much difference. I mean, not long ago, uh, actually before the pandemic, I, I was in Amsterdam and cycled in Amsterdam and was amazed by the fact that there, cyclists had priorities and, yeah. uh, and, and motorists deferred to them. It was a completely different world and you felt completely safe. I would have had my young children, well, well my, my child when he was young, cycling along. I think we need a much more profound transformation in the nature of, uh, of, of, of travel. So there are a few sticking plasters around. It's a bad idea to take away cycle lanes. We need to go so much further in reconfiguring the nature of our travel and also as we've discussed before, making sure it's affordable, that it's subsidized and that it's available. We also need to think carefully, not only about solutions in urban areas, but in rural areas. Because again, as we saw in France, a lot of the opposition um, you know, around um, changes in, 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 in the cost of petrol were in rural areas and, and rural poverty is something we don't take seriously enough. Well, yes, as somebody who represents a rural constituency, I would agree there are many different issues, rural areas. Uh, as, as usual, a lot of questions came in towards the end. That's life, isn't it? Um, and we must end there. Uh, I was going to ask you for a minute to sum up. I don't know if you want to say a final few words, or are you happy just to? Zarina, you want to say a few words? Yeah, um, I was just going to say that. Um, Going back to what Stephen says, is that we have to remember our place within the environment, our place within the globe, um, in the global community, and just to be connected and to respect one another, and also to respect the planet. So let's move from the, as I say, from the ego to the eco. Lloyd, do you want to? Yes. Uh, well, my summing up would be that uh, whatever happens at COP, it's. Uh, that whatever happens, whether anything is agreed or isn't agreed, this decade, the 2020s, is the decade when real change has to happen. Uh, the sooner it happens, the easier it will be. Uh, and what we need is for the governments at all levels to uh, respond to COP rather than at being at COP, respond to COP by turning their targets and their rhetoric into real action. So I think that the the, the, and that action needs to be policy change, but it also needs to be leadership, because I think there is. Oh, you've been you've been muted. <laughs> I don't know whether yeah, we're running out of Zoom. Public, I think there is public support for change. Mm -hmm. uh, we can engage the public even more. We can encourage behavioural change, but that will not happen unless government facilitates it. I thought we'd lost our Zoom slot for a minute. You were being you know, <laughs> tail. And Stephen, briefly, please. Thank you. So one of the things that I've been rabbiting on about in the pandemic is time and again, especially at the UK level, governments have failed to take action, claiming that the problem lies in the public, that the public won't put up with it. And the evidence has shown the opposite. The public want it and the government aren't doing it. And I think it's the same on climate change. The public aren't the problem. The public aren't the issue. Governments have got to take this seriously. And individuals, yes, we've got to act. But more importantly than acting individually, we've got to act collectively to make sure that governments take this as seriously as we are. So I hope to see you all at COP26. Well, can I can I thank you all very much for your time this evening? It's absolutely fascinating. It was a delight to chair it. Can I remind everybody for <laughs> online, there's another meeting tonight, 7.30, conversation with the world-renowned scientists, 
uh, Professor Susan Simard, uh, who will be discussing inequalities in COVID-19, uh, as we have been already dealing with tonight, uh, to invent or saving us from the climate crisis in something that's called Big Brains for Big Solutions, um, and the role of art and culture in our health and well-being. So there you are. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, you may be a professor one day, uh, uh, Zarina. Who knows? I may have started a ball, a ball rolling. On the other <laughs> hand, I could have given you the black spot. <laughs> career. But thank you all very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Good thank night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye, thanks. Good night.